Hello and welcome to the Tiny Little Workshop. My name is Bill and today I'll be explaining the very basics of turntables and how to hook them up so you can get the music off of these funny black plastic discs, turn it into an electrical signal, and finally sounds that your ears can hear. Now in this video I'll be going over records, beginner turntables, pre-amplifiers, amplifiers, and finally the speakers or headphones. I'll also cover how to identify a decent turntable based on 10 very handy key features. So stick around. Perhaps you're just starting out in the analog music world. You've been curious about what's up with all the fuss surrounding vinyl. Well, before we get into any of the equipment related stuff, I wanted to go over some of the pros and cons of vinyl playback. If you were just here to find out about my hints and tips for picking out a decent turntable, feel free to skip ahead, won't hurt my feelings whatsoever. One of the biggest and most readily apparent differences with vinyl is the physicality of the experience, the tactile feedback that you get. There's a size and a weight. There's the way that you have to get up out of your chair, walk across the room, flip the record over halfway through playback and put it back down so you can listen to side two. It's a much more intimate and hands-on approach to music playback and for me at least that's part of the appeal. Regarding sound quality, to be bluntly honest right up front, with regard to the beginner turntable setups like we'll be discussing today, you may or may not even notice a quality difference between vinyl and digital music, be it streaming or physical media, whatever you've been listening to in the past. There are those who believe that a vinyl record sound has a warmer, richer feel to it. This being in comparison to what perhaps they might call the cold and clinical precision of digital recordings. Those on the digital side might point out that it has a wider dynamic range, a lower noise floor. They might talk about RIAA equalization being used with vinyl. We'll talk about that later. I am not here to pick a side and getting into the fine details regarding analog versus digital is not really what this video is about, though I do expect the comment section will probably fill up with some of it regardless of what I say here. Personally, I've been listening to vinyl on and off for a number of years and only recently have my critical listening skills and my playback equipment improved to a point where I can start to hear some of the differences that other more experienced listeners talk about. Now this isn't to say that you need the latest and greatest electronics in the world in order to enjoy records. For example, all of my stuff, everything that you're going to see in this video has been acquired secondhand or from thrift stores. And I believe that with a few key budget-friendly components, a very pleasurable listening experience can be had by the vast majority of people. And with all that out of the way, before we can even begin discussing records, we should probably have some understanding of what sound is. Sound is vibrations at its core. It's a wave passing through a medium, in our case, air, as it gets to our ears. So what is a record? A record is a spiraling series of these waves, these vibrations, pressed into a physical medium. Newer ones are made from polyvinyl chloride, PVC, it's a plastic, while these older ones were made from shellac, are much thicker, but they're also very fragile. Now before the advent of electrically amplified sound, very old record players just used a giant horn to amplify that very weak little sound of the needle moving back and forth in the groove. I'll actually play you a clip of how quiet this unamplified sound is by placing a microphone very close to the needle. I'm expecting that this song is probably in the public domain by now. Now that was a modern LP, the very, very old ones, they used a steel needle riding back and forth in these really wide grooves and the needle had to be sharpened or replaced quite frequently. Now the records also spun at 78 revolutions per minute, which means you could only fit one or two songs on each side. Modern records, on the other hand, they have much narrower grooves, about three to five times narrower, and they play at a slower speed. The larger ones, they play at 
33 and a third RPM, while the little 7 inch ones spin at 45 RPM. The job of any modern turntable or record player is to turn those vibrations picked up by the stylus into an electrical signal that can then be amplified to eventually reach our ears. All right, hopefully you're still with me so far. It's always been throughout history about these little bitty waves reaching our ears in one form or another. Now I think it's time that we go over the basic anatomy of a modern turntable. Hopefully then we can trace the path of those waves, those signals. First up is the stylus, also called a needle. On modern equipment, it is a teeny, tiny little chunk of industrial diamond attached to a hollow metal tube and suspended by rubber. It rides in the grooves of a spinning record, vibrating back and forth. Next up is the cartridge. Many people just shorten this down to cart. This is the little box that translates the back and forth movement of the stylus into a weak electrical signal. Most modern equipment uses a moving magnet cartridge and we'll go over that a little bit later. The general idea is that close to the rubber suspension on the cantilever, there are magnets moving back and forth. Inside the cartridge, there is a corresponding coil of wire for each channel that picks up on those vibrations, converting them to an alternating electrical current. The head shell is the part that holds the cartridge to the tone arm. Typically, the two are secured together with small machine screws. This particular example has a removable head shell. The tone arm, or arm, has the head shell attached at one end, and on the other end is a pivot so that it can smoothly follow the groove as the record plays. Small wires run inside the tone arm, carrying along that electrical signal from the cartridge further up the chain. The platter is the big round part that the record sits on. It'll usually have some kind of mat on top. The plinth is pretty much the base of the turntable. It may or may not be separately suspended. And here are the wires that typically come out of a turntable. The power cord is what plugs into an electrical outlet. These are the RCA cables. These cords and connectors carry the musical signal out of the turntable and onto the preamplifier, receiver, or amplifier, which we'll get to in a minute. The ground cable, if it's available, connects to the ground lug on a preamp or receiver. This can help cut down on buzzing sounds that may interfere with music playback. So we've just seen the path that the signal takes coming off of the record going through the turntable and now we need to go over the rest of the equipment necessary to get that signal into something that our ears can hear. If you're just starting out and you have a turntable, perhaps look around your house and see what else you've got. Maybe there's a stereo, a home theater receiver, something like that. You may be able to hook a turntable up to one of those. If not, I want to go over a few additional pieces aside from just the turntable that you will need in order to start hearing the music. As we've already established, the turntable is the source of the electrical signal containing the music. Any other components in the chain will be there to help amplify and boost that signal until it's something powerful enough to drive speakers. The signal that is generated by the stylus moving back and forth in those little miniature grooves, it is extremely weak. It's in the order of about three to six millivolts, three to six thousandths of a volt for the most common moving magnet cartridges available today. This very, very weak electrical signal is given boost, oomph, it's pre-amplified up to a certain level. After it is passed through a pre-amplifier, the signal might be as strong as about half a volt to one and a half volts on the loudest musical passages. Then a second stage of amplification can give it another boost or two. That final fully amplified signal is at last sent out to the speakers or headphones. Now that may still seem a bit complicated, but I'm attempting to keep it as simple as I can here. Now perhaps some diagrams will help show how this works. I'd like to lay out some simple, typical listening setups and continue to walk through the path that the musical signal takes on its journey to our ears. Turntable to receiver or integrated amplifier in turn to speakers or headphones. 
turntable to preamplifier to power amplifier to speakers or headphones. Turntable to preamplifier to powered speakers. Let's go over a few notes about preamplifiers. Sometimes they are built into the turntable itself while other turntables need an external form of preamplification. It seems like a decent number of the newer turntables on the market do have a built-in preamplifier, while the ones that I come across at yard sales and thrift stores, the ones made from the 60s through the 80s, they do not. If your turntable does have a built-in preamplifier, it will probably say so somewhere on the packaging or in the owner's manual, so have a look around. This particular model of turntable features a switch on the underside that allows you to enable or disable the internal preamp. If your turntable does not have a built-in preamp, then you will generally hook up the RCA cables, those red and white ones we saw earlier, to the phono input of a receiver or external preamp. A receiver is a kind of all-in-one amplifier box that also has an AM-FM tuner. There is a similar kind of component known as the integrated amplifier, which is like a receiver, but without the AM-FM tuner. Most every vintage two-channel receiver or integrated amp will have at least one phono input. Now some of the high-end home theater receivers, the surround sound ones, and also a number of the older home theater receivers have a built-in phono input. The phono input is special. Nothing aside from a turntable should ever be hooked up to the phono input. It is meant to amplify very weak signals from a turntable. So if you hook up a more powerful source of music, say from an iPod or a smartphone or a CD player, you could damage your amplifier or your speakers. So watch out for that. There is a more complex rationale for using the phono input, including the one I mentioned earlier, RIAA equalization. Now, you don't really need to know what RIAA equalization is in order to enjoy music playback. Just know that it is a way that engineers figured out to put more music on a disc. In the very early days, the signal put on the record was without any sort of equalization, and then they figured out if they squished the bass notes down and kind of expanded out the treble notes, they could kind of make the wave roughly even in size all the way throughout. And so RIAA equalization is undoing that. It's amplifying up the bass notes and toning down the treble notes. So if you hook up <laughs> anything else to a phono input, it will sound badly distorted. The first example I'm going to show you is from a class of inexpensive external preamplifiers made specifically for turntables. This one I picked up for five bucks at a yard sale. This kind of preamp may only have two sets of RCA jacks, a ground lug, and perhaps a switch for the kind of stylus that the turntable is equipped with. They typically do not include a volume knob or any sort of tone controls, bass, treble, that sort of thing. The turntable's RCA cables are attached to the input side of the preamp, and then a separate set of RCA cables are run to the auxiliary, CD tape, whatever input you can find on the back of the receiver or amplifier. These kind of basic devices allow you to hook up a turntable to basically anything with RCA inputs. A receiver, an amplifier, a pair of powered speakers, a computer, whatever you've got. At the higher end of the spectrum is the more fully featured separate preamplifier. It is a standalone component whose sole purpose in life is to receive signals from different sources, apply whatever gain is necessary, and send the signal boosted out to a separate power amplifier. On the back of the unit you will generally find a variety of inputs and on the front will be buttons to switch between the inputs, a volume knob, and perhaps some tone controls. This kind of device is generally found in more expensive systems and it has to be paired with a separate power amplifier in order to power a set of speakers. Whichever type of system you are using, the last step is to hook up some speakers to the speaker terminals or plug in some headphones to be able to listen to music. The way that I personally started listening to vinyl was with a second-hand refurbished turntable I bought at a record store, a home theater receiver that I already had, and some hand-me-down speakers for my parents. It was very simple, but it was enough to get me hooked.
10 things to look for in a decent turntable. So far we have covered general turntable anatomy and some of the amplification equipment that you will need to be able to hear what's on a record. Now we're going to get into the 10 basic identifying features of a decent turntable. And in this section I'll also be covering some basic setup. And before you do any setup on your turntable, it's a good idea to make sure that it is as level as you can make it. You can use just about any old decent bubble level and you can measure side to side, front to back, and also make sure to go from one corner to another diagonally on each of the diagonals. If your turntable doesn't have adjustable feet on the bottom, you can stick some kind of a shim under the corner and just get it as flat as you can make it and that will help make sure that all these subsequent adjustments are more accurate. 1. Adjustable counterbalance. This is found at the back of the tone arm where it pivots. The reasoning behind having an adjustable counterbalance on the tone arm is so you can adjust how much downward pressure the stylus puts on the record itself. On many turntables it will be a large round weight. There are other styles of counterweight adjustment out there like this spring loaded mechanism or this counterweight that you can loosen a set screw and slide back and forth on this older 1950s turntable. The round style is probably the most common though. It has two parts, a weight on the back that can be turned to bring the weight closer or further from the pivot point, and a marking ring on the front with gradations. Turning the front ring will not spin the weight, but turning the weight will spin them both. Each stylus maker has specifications for how much pressure the counterbalance should be set to. Too much pressure will more quickly wear out the record and the stylus and probably color the sound. Too little pressure can cause the stylus to skip out of the record groove entirely or perhaps even not reproduce all of the musical signal because it is floating near the top of a record's groove. Let me show you how this works with a round style of counterweight. I'm going to walk through setting the counterbalance now. The first step to this is to make sure that we turn the counterbalance until the arm is gently floating. This is not gently floating. This is sticking way up in the air. We want it to be basically hovering there balance so we just kind of turn it a little bit at a time until it just kind of seems to free float. Turn it back the other way a smidgen there and it seems to be about free floating here. And then we will adjust this counter to zero. From here we will turn it to the recommended pressure for the arm. In this case one and a half grams. Ta-da! That's it. It's set. Number two, anti-skating adjustment. We've just established that downward pressure on the stylus is important. It needs to be in a Goldilocks zone. Not too much, not too little. And along those same lines, side to side pressure on the stylus is also important and it is set using something called the anti-skate adjustment. This is usually found near the pivot point of the tone arm. After the counterbalance has been set to the specification called for by the stylus or cartridge manufacturer, then the anti-skate pressure is usually set the same as or quite close to the stylus pressure. If this isn't calibrated correctly, then there will be too much pressure on one side of the record groove. This will create extra wear on that side of the stylus and the record. Number three, stiff but lightweight tone arm that can pivot smoothly. Now tone arms can be made from any variety of lightweight materials including exotic stuff like titanium, ceramic, carbon fiber. For the beginner turntables that we're going to be talking about, the most common type you're going to come across is aluminum. It's lightweight, it's inexpensive, and it's strong. It might be bare metal, anodized black, painted any number of colors. Tone arms can also come in different shapes and lengths. The most common shapes are straight tubes and S shapes. As I've already pointed out, most turntables have a tone arm that is fixed on one end 
while the other end swings out over the record. There are some exceptions like linear tracking turntables, but we're not covering their particular setup requirements in this video. Some turntables may include instructions for how to lubricate the pivot. Others might have some kind of a sealed system or the pivot might not be accessible. There are a number of variations out there. Number four, cueing lever. This one is pretty simple. Use this lever to raise and lower the tone arm. Some tables allow for manual playback, so the cueing lever is used to raise the tone arm, the record is started spinning, and then the lever is used to gently lower the tone arm and stylus back down onto the playing surface. Uh, please be nice to the stylus and the tone arm. Don't drop them especially. If you were to drop the arm onto the surface of the record, when it hits, it can generate a signal strong enough to destroy an amplifier or the speakers that are hooked up to it, so be very careful. On nicer turntables, the cueing mechanism lowers very smoothly on an oil-filled piston so that it contacts the record surface in a gentle and controlled manner. Number five, playback controls. Automatic controls might be a matter of personal preference. I like when it starts the record playing and picks up the needle when it's done. Other people prefer to manually control every aspect of record playback. I personally really like it when the record player will automatically start the platter spinning, position the tone arm correctly for the first track, and then lower it into place. Equally as nice is when the turntable can recognize that it has reached the end of one side of the album, raise the tone arm, put it back in its holder, and stop the platter spinning all by itself. Fully manual turntables without automatic controls must be watched closely because they don't stop when the record is at an end, and the needle will just keep sitting in the groove while the record spins right there next to the label, just spinning and spinning and spinning until you stop it yourself. Number six, shock absorbers. These come in all shapes and sizes. Some tables have soft, compliant feet on the bottom of the plinth. Others could have some sort of springy, isolated island for the platter to float on, keeping it separate from the rest of the body. Whatever the method, the purpose is the same to prevent any external vibrations from transferring to the stylus as it's reading in the record grooves. This includes everything from, say, the bass notes coming out of your woofers, to toe tapping on a wood floor, to rambunctious kids running around. Any vibration, movement, bumping of the table can transfer to the stylus, which will be picked up and you can probably hear it through the speakers. I'm actually even gonna demonstrate a little bit of what this sounds like by tapping on the platter while it's playing and recording what's coming out of the speakers. Many vintage receivers had a subsonic or infrasonic filter to try and keep these and other low rumbles from getting amplified and damaging the speakers. Number seven, a heavy platter. Now a heavy platter might not be the most important thing when you're first starting out, but it is a nicety because it acts like a flywheel. The inertia of having additional mass in the platter helps to smooth out any variations in speed from the motor. Decent platters are usually made from aluminum, steel, or even acrylic. In my opinion, any turntable with a thin plastic platter is best avoided. Just like this cheap all-in-one that has a plastic platter that's been painted silver to make it look like it's made of aluminum. Most platters will also have a slip mat on top of them made from rubber, cork, or perhaps felt. Number eight, cartridges. The two most common Cartridge types you'll come across are ceramic and moving magnet. There's a third called moving coil, but its cost and complexity is beyond the scope of this video. So getting back to the first one, ceramic. It's an older technology, and it's also cheaper to manufacture in this day and age, which means it winds up on really inexpensive modern turntables. They will be found on especially old record players, kids' record players, portable record players, and really cheaply made modern turntables. The Chinese USB turntables you might find at the grocery store per se, they will most likely have a ceramic cartridge. The Crosley brand record players have them, as well as many of the other modern retro looking players from brands such as 
Electro Home, Jensen, Grace Digital, Innovative Technology, Pile, Tech Play, and others. The ceramic cartridge doesn't require as much preamplification as a moving magnet cartridge because it generates a signal that's fairly strong, about 200 millivolts up to 1200 millivolts. Now, this was fine in the past before we had access to really cheap solid state amplification devices like we have now, so it's not really necessary in our day and age unless you are making a very inexpensive product and don't want to spend too much money on the cartridge and the pre-amplification circuitry. One major disadvantage of ceramic cartridges is that many of them were designed to put a lot of pressure on the record groove. They can sometimes be found running from 4 to 10 grams of pressure or more depending on the turntable. This kind of pressure will wear out records much, much more quickly. I do want to point out that there are scales you can purchase to measure the exact weight that your stylus is putting on a record groove. In the 1950s, the moving magnet cartridge started to gain widespread popularity. Most moving magnet cartridge manufacturers design their carts to run with about 1 to 3 grams of pressure on the stylus, so this will make the records last much longer. By design, the moving magnet cartridge also generates a weaker electrical signal, around 3 to 6 millivolts or so. So this requires a better preamplifier, but since the 1960s, most of the receivers and preamps out there have been designed with moving magnet cartridges in mind. The higher end cartridges I mentioned earlier, the moving coil type, they generate an even weaker electrical signal, so they need an even better design and thus more expensive preamplifier, which is why they're not being covered in this guide, but I just wanted to mention that they do exist. Number nine, the stylus or needle. The stylus is an item that wears out over time as it's used. Your typical diamond tip stylus will need replacement after about a thousand hours, though some people will go as high as 2,000 or more hours before putting a new one on. Now, all of the turntables that I own have been purchased secondhand, so for me, it is cheap insurance to just buy a brand new stylus instead of taking a risk on an unknown tip. It is possible to get a high powered loop or a microscope and look at the stylus tip, see how worn it is, but even then you still have no idea how many records it has played and how many hours of use have been worn onto it. Also, if care isn't taken when moving the turntable or tone arm, the stylus itself could bend or even break. A bent stylus most likely cannot be just simply straightened. Typically, the stylus tip is adhered to a hollow tube called the cantilever. If you attempt to straighten that hollow cantilever, it's more than likely going to sustain further damage. So the trick is, take care of the stylus in the first place, and your records will thank you. You don't have to go overboard, but I personally prefer to leave the stylus cover on and the tone arm locked down when my turntable's not in use, just in case it gets bumped on accident. Some styli also come with a handy flip-down guard for the stylus when it isn't in use. Just look at how tiny and fragile the tip of the stylus is. It needs all the help that you can give it. While we're on the subject, there are different kinds of stylus available. They come in different shapes and diameters. We'll go over diameter first. The larger diameters were meant for the really old shellac records, the ones I showed you earlier that spun at 78 RPM. They have really wide grooves. Modern turntables have narrower grooves and need a smaller diameter tip on the stylus. Now we could talk about stylus shapes. I believe that a diamond tipped round or elliptical stylus will suffice for the majority of beginners. DJs and those concerned with record wear will often opt for a round tip shape because it doesn't contact very much of the walls of a record's groove. Elliptical shaped styli are cut in such a way that they contact more of the groove and can more closely track the signal. Moving into the pricey side of things, there are hyper elliptical, shibata, and even more exotic cuts of styli out there. They come in many different shapes and contours, and each one is supposed to more faithfully follow the record's grooves, but of course, they are more expensive. Number 10, cartridges. 
specifically replaceability and adjustability. Since this is a beginner discussion, we are talking about mostly moving magnet cartridges. And as far as longevity goes, the cartridge is generally really long lived, at least in relation to a stylus. It is possible with a vintage cartridge that it could have some kind of corrosion inside, uh, hardening of internal components, or they could become brittle with age. It's just something to be aware of. Cartridges are one item, probably the most popular item that enthusiasts like to upgrade. They get really crazy and they put in new tone arms and wiring and platters and all kinds of other stuff, but cartridges are the most popular to start out with. So for this and other reasons, I recommend a turntable that allows you to at least replace the cartridge should it wear out or you decide to upgrade sometime down the road. The cart generally attaches to the tone arm or head shell with two small machine screws. If you're using a P-mount cartridge, this will be a pressure fit instead. There are also usually four very small and very fragile wires hooked up to the cartridge. A cartridge can be removed and replaced with another at any time with enough patience, care, and some tools like a small screwdriver and tweezers or needle-nose pliers to deal with those tiny wire connectors. For beginner listening, I'm going to recommend just a decent mid-level cartridge to start out with or just whatever's on the turntable you already have. When you're starting out, you're not likely to notice big differences between different cartridges. There are other features and niceties out there, but these are my top 10, the things that I look for when I'm looking for a decent turntable. Bonus round. And as a bonus, here I'm throwing in some information on drive types and motors. Rim drive. The motor spins a thin metal shaft. A mechanism pushes a rubber idler wheel against the shaft while also pressing the rubber wheel into the inside lip of the platter, which causes it to start spinning. One concern with these is that with age, the rubber idler wheel can harden, but products do exist which are designed to soften old rubber. Belt drive. The motor spins a metal shaft attached to a belt. That belt is also wrapped around a special inner lip on the platter or around the outside edge of it, which causes it to spin. The rubber belt can also act as a kind of shock absorber to help smooth out some of the variations in the spin speed of the motor. This belt does have a finite lifespan because rubber tends to become brittle or stretch over time. Belt replacement is usually a fairly simple procedure and it's most likely covered in the owner's manual. Don't have the owner's manual? Try looking it up online. You'll be surprised what you can find in PDF format. When you're handling the belt, make sure to keep any grease or grime away from it. And also, don't use alcohol to clean the belt or any other rubber components inside the turntable itself. Direct drive. The motor shaft is attached directly to the platter. There are no rubber parts to wear out. Speaking of motors, with enough time, the lubrication on the motor could harden or be lost through other means. Applying a small amount of light oil or lithium grease to certain components inside of a vintage turntable is sometimes just the thing to liven it back up. Further setup. We've already gone over the basics of setting the counterbalance and the anti-skate. The next step from here is to align the cartridge with a protractor. In the description of the video down below, there will be a link to one you can download for free from Vinyl Engine's website. They do require registration, but it's fairly painless. You can download the image, print it out, and stick it on your turntable and follow the instructions that I'm going to show you to align the cartridge. There are, of course, other more expensive options for doing this, but for a beginner setup, this is perfect. After printing out this example, I used my pocket knife to score an X in the center of the protractor. It was crude, but it worked. Place the protractor on the platter and use it to make sure that the cart and stylus are aligned properly. The head shell on the tone arm, the thing that the cartridge is screwed to, usually has a couple of slots in it. The machine screws holding the cartridge to the head shell can be loosened, and the whole cartridge can be carefully turned until it is straight and parallel to the record groove as it plays. To check this, 
gently set the stylus tip down in the center hash on one side of the protractor grid. Look down on the cartridge from above and observe if it is square and lined up with the lines off to either side. Lift up the arm assembly and move it over to the other side of the protractor to check and see if it is in alignment there as well. If it's not, then gently adjust the angle until it is. It may be difficult to perfectly align the cartridge with both sides and may require moving the cartridge forward or backward as well as rotating it one way or another. When starting out, it might just be easiest to set it so that it falls somewhere between the two settings. With the alignment properly set, you can then tighten the screws back down. Improper alignment of the cartridge and stylus combination can lead to improper wear on one side of the record, very similar to what happens with an improperly adjusted anti-skate knob. Another common adjustment found on a decent number of turntables is pitch. This relates to how fast or slow the platter is spinning. Some turntables may have a way to manually adjust playback speed. Others might use some kind of a strobing light or quartz crystal timing to automatically regulate playback speed. Just listen to the range of pitch variation as I play back this 45 that I found that turned out to be high school marching band music from the 60s. If you've been following along so far, hopefully you feel comfortable hooking up a turntable to a receiver or an amplifier of some sort and connecting speakers or headphones to that. With all of that in place, hopefully you've made sure that the table is level, you've set the stylus pressure and the anti-skate, you have aligned the cartridge and stylus by using a protractor, and if your turntable is fancy enough, you've adjusted the playback speed to ensure that it's coming out at exactly what it's supposed to be. There are some other even finer, more incremental little adjustments and improvements that can be made, things like arm length, arm height, arm angle, vertical tracking angle, those are even finer, more minuscule little things that I'm not going to cover, but if you want to, you can go ahead and do some research on those. They're a little beyond the scope of this video. Now you feel like you're ready to just go ahead and slap down some vinyl and start listening. But before we get to that, we're really close. Before we get to that, just indulge me in a little word or two about cleanliness and the proper handling of vinyl records. Records are sold new within a paper or plastic sleeve that fits inside the album cover. Records should only be handled at the outside edge or around the label. Don't place your fingers on the grooves because they will leave behind oily residue, which dust loves to adhere to. Slowly removing the record from the sleeve will also help prevent static buildup. I live in the dry southwestern United States and our general lack of humidity can cause considerable static buildup. And static on a record surface will quickly attract dust from the air around it and stick to the surface of the record itself. If a record is especially worn, damaged, or scratched, it'll generally sound static filled, it'll have pops, or it'll sound distorted. So, by extension, clean, undamaged vinyl sounds the best. There are a number of cleaners and anti-static devices sold to help remedy dirty and dusty vinyl. Retailers also sell special brushes to clean any accumulated dust, oil, or dirt off the stylus. And you always brush in the direction of the stylus travel. There you have it. That's my guide to getting started listening to vinyl, the equipment you need, and how to not damage anything. As with any hobby, this is a rabbit hole that can go as deep as you let it. Maybe in another video I'll get into some more things, but for now, don't get hung up on having the biggest and best and newest stuff. A decent quality turntable with some of the features that I've outlined will get you started on the right track. With some clean, quality vinyl, a cheap to mid-level receiver, 
and some nice speakers, I can almost guarantee that you're going to start out happy. Is the turntable powered on? Is the receiver or amplifier on and set to a low volume setting to begin? Do you have a clean record on the turntable? Well, raise that tone arm lever, hit play, and lower it gently down into a little slice of bliss. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.